Hello, I'm Dr. Stephen Hassan with another episode of the Influence Continuum. And I am so excited to share one of my favorite people on planet Earth with my audience, someone who has really touched my heart, my soul, and redirected my life, really. Uh, Reb Moshe Waldux uh, is my guest today. And um, Moshe Waldux, I credit for bringing me back to Judaism, really. Um, for those of my followers, you know, I got in the Moonies and I went on this long spiritual quest to figure out what I believed, et cetera, et cetera, over many, many years. Um, I did, Moshe, uh, Taste for Judaism, uh, put on by the Reform Congregation, and uh, I agreed with everything I heard in those several hour courses. And then it was like, well, how do we find, how do I find a shul? How do I find a community? And uh, a friend at the time had seen you in the Boston Globe. There was a big feature article uh, with you. And she said, let's go check out this rabbi. He wrote the big book of Jewish humor. And I was like, huh? I read that book in my bar mitzvah way back when. <laughs> Uh, it's yeah. a very famous book with Bill Novak, and you know it's right. funny. It's still it's still in print, and it's still in print. So 40, I remember 40, forty-one years. Yeah. I remember going to Brookline to Temple Beth Zion uh, in nineteen ninety-eight. Um, there were wooden pews. There was an oh, iron with, right. railing across right. the 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 bima. The front, yeah. And uh, yeah, Erwin yeah. Pless was the president. You were there part time, and uh, I listened. And for a while, to, right, right. For a while, we you, we had only we met in the chapel downstairs because we didn't have that. And it yeah, sort of so grew, it grew, grew. It was, it yeah. was. Uh, there were, I think, there were forty people or something. It was an old conservative temple, and mm. and Erwin and other other um, of the founders were like, we need a new approach. Let's try this breath of life thing that Moshe mm -hmm. Waldox uh, is offering. And when I learned more about your trip to see the Dalai Lama and uh, the Jew in the Lotus, and a friend did the documentary that Robert, Roger Kamenetz wrote the book on about right. the Dalai Lama wanting to understand how the Jews survived in exile and your whole trip there. Then I was like, I need to check this guy out. And I remember <laughs> bringing you to lunch <laughs> several times and asked you, asking you question after question because I was that distrustful, honestly, of any leader, of any spiritual leader. And I just wanted to know that there was a foundation here of trust and something that I could resonate, not the Judaism of my childhood, which was Hillcrest sure. Jewish Center in Flushing, Queens. Um, yeah. And so here we are. The, 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 the temple is flourishing. You're now the rabbi emeritus. Uh, uh, Rav Claudia Kreiman has taken over. And I've been wanting, I, I've interviewed you before, but not for the podcast. And I wanted to introduce the world to um, a, a, an approach to Judaism that feels right and healthy in 21st century. And you're doing a play, a one-person play called You Can Live If They Let You, uh, September 12th to 15th, so 2024, the Plaza mm -hmm. Theater in Boston. And you're going to videotape it, so hopefully it'll have a life beyond the play. And I bought six tickets already uh, in advance. But let's just touch a couple more things, and then there's so many directions we can go in this conversation, because we're now recording it in August before the 2024 election. Of course, the October 7th attack by Hamas of Israel and the retaliatory uh, attacks uh, in Gaza and all of that. So we'll, we can touch on that. But I really want to talk about a healthy approach to Judaism that isn't stereotyped and that uh, can bring you know some subtlety and some nuance to 
the conversation about Judaism because there are religious extremists in Judaism as there are in Christianity Absolutely. and Islam Absolutely. and Hinduism. And I, I, as you know, I call this podcast The Influence Continuum because I want to talk about healthy stuff and not just the unhealthy uh, mm -hmm. influence. So let's see, what else did I miss? You're the child of Holocaust survivors, that you're a scholar. I love your Torah studies. I, you, you made me a, a, reb, a regular. I just love to sit around the table and you would be teaching, but asking us questions and what did we think about this and that. And I right, just love right, that right. approach right. to learning. Um, and you also do meditation. You, do, you founded the Nishmat Hayim Breath of Life Jewish Meditation Community, and you're a long-time meditator. So yes, with that, been, uh, Reb Moshe Waldox. Well, thank you, thank you Stephen. for Thank you for, uh, for your uh, invitation, and uh, more, more and more, thank you for, uh, for all that you've done over the last uh, 30 years now. I guess it's almost 30 years you've been professional in this. Uh, it's 48, but who's counting? 48? Wow, time flies. But that's great. I think it's very important that uh, uh, you basically are uh, you know, trying to alert people to the fact that they, they do have capacity to make their own choices. Right. And it seems, as we look at the world and this sort of tendency towards authoritarianism, there seems to be a lot of people who don't want to, who want to have choices made for them. And as you know, uh, the di dictators historically, you know, uh, really take advantage as, uh, you know, of, of the fact that there are people who really want to follow. They really want. And we have a culture where we even we even encourage it. For instance, when I go online, I, I'm asked, do I want to follow someone on X? <laughs> right. And, and, and wow, what a success. This person has 100,000 followers. And I right. say, gee, it's a really bad way of understanding how we, how you st stand in the world, and uh, and it's funny how it's really embedded in the way we think and, and say, oh, what's your success? I have a hundred thousand followers. People right. have made me made me sort of an object of concentration, and 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 in a sense, living your life through that person, which is a very uh, deleterious way to live your life. It's tough tough enough living yeah, your own life. <laughs> you know what I mean? And it's not uh, in real life. It's not real friends no. and not real people. Many times yeah. they're bots or all kinds yeah. of, you I know, strange. To, you know, yeah. when, I, when I first started Facebook, I don't do it much now, but I, I didn't realize it. You know, so anybody who wanted to be a friend, I invited. So I have, I have, I have you know, a thousand friends. So I said to Anne, my wife, I said, maybe I'll, I'll ask, I'll say, look, you know, I'm so glad we're friends. Uh, I've been going through tough times. And if each of you could just send me $50, not a lot. That, That's funny. You know, as an April 1st kind of thing, maybe, you know. Yeah. And who knows? Maybe 500 will, 100 will. But the point is uh, that's a real friend that when you need something, they're willing to step f f f you know, f forward for you. So, yeah, yeah. I, I think we, uh, we are, we are in, look, every generation has felt that it's, 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 it's facing doom, mm. <laughs> you know. It is, we're not the first generation, you know. We're the first generation that has the capacity to bring on doomsday in a way that, uh, you know, in the way that it's, uh, with climate change particularly, it's really, yeah, really, really, really possible now in a, in a real way. Uh, yeah. We will kill ourselves ultimately. <laughs> you know, we don't have to oh, have let's enemies not forget out there. Nuclear weapons nuclear as well. And also yeah, now yeah, yeah. AI and potential pandemic things that I, can be the pandemics developed. will continue the content with that all that will continue because the world is a very uh it's a very small place today somebody sneezes yeah. in china i've got to say gesundheit here yeah and it just so, goes around goes around so what i've loved about my relationship with you is you've always had a sense of humor even in the darkest of times and even in the holiest of moments, I'll never forget you on Yom Kippur. You, you told a joke. The, the about, Kol Nidre joke. The Kol Nidre joke. Okay, you want to share it? Well, I've done so many of them. People came to expect it. So the hardest thing all to prepare, the hardest thing to prepare was finding the right joke that would lead huh. into my sermon. 
And ultimately, right. people told me the only thing I remember of your sermon is the joke. <laughs> <laughs> well, you the, know, one, the one that I comes to mind is uh, the young boy uh, who is uh, not experienced or something. Do you remember? Do you remember? Does that bring back that any... experience in what? Experience in what? I don't know. With women. Oh, with women. I don't recall that particular one, but there's some, uh, there are okay. uh, others I do recall. Uh, and, you well, know, some of these are classic jokes, but the bottom line, as I said, the, the thing is, how do you make the joke really bring you to the point? Because the rest of the sermons, as you're familiar with on, on Yom Kippur, for those who don't know, it's the Day of Atonement, and uh, we ask people to repair their lives and start new, and everybody gets a, a second chance, and uh, et cetera. Right. Uh, and, and basically, what are you going to say? You screwed up, do better. That's basically it, right? In mm -hmm. a nutshell, what you say. You, you had a chance, here's a second chance. And that's something about mm -hmm. Jewish culture is we never cancel anybody out. We don't cancel people. We always believe mm -hmm. there's a chance, there's a second chance, there's a third chance, and every year you get a chance. And uh, sometimes you, uh, it, it works for people. And they say, oh, there is room for change in my life. There's room for uh, emphasizing more important things than my own ego needs, which is what most people right. operate on now, you know, their own ego needs. So, yes, I, so look, I never preached piety. We mm -hmm. were not an orthodox shul. Uh, we were an unorthodox shul. We're not affiliated with anybody. We have no ax to grind. They have no ax to grind. All I say is to people, uh, is basically uh, how do you really develop uh, an integrated personality? And I've said that many, mm. many times. The, that's what it's all about. And of course, the next step is, you know, there's a, a Yiddish expression called being a mensch, a mensch, mm -hmm. which is a responsive. It means being responsive. And the next one, which people don't like, is being responsible. <laughs> Responsibility <laughs> is a tough word for a lot of people now, you know. And God forbid you should mm. say uh, obligation. At best, you could say a suggestion. Mm. So Moses came down from the mountain with ten suggestions. Mm. <laughs> you know. You also, I also remember you said teaching it was utterances was a more correct yes, translation. Yes, right. It's, uh, it's as not, it's to not right, right, right. Commandment. It's not because we have in our tradition there are so many commandments, uh, but uh, they are not put into that category really as much because there are other things. But the bottom line is uh, when you live in a Christian culture, you, you basically uh, have to accept the fact that there's a different way of seeing things. And we're not all the same, which is great. Uh, you know, I'm a big believer in uh, bridge building between different uh, faith communities because I think ultimately we're all the same boat. Uh, and, right. uh, and, and of course, the people that you meet in these things are very self-selected, and you feel very good about the fact that you have people in every tradition uh, who really know they should be ashamed of their own <laughs> denomination. <laughs> yeah, have, yeah, or elements of it, at least. Or elements of it. Are... So, you know, I went to the Parliament of World Religions a number of years back, a number of years ago, and you see people from all over the world come together. You know, at least the people who have come together have said, oh, it's good to come together. So, yeah. So people enjoy each other, you know, and there's that commonality. Right. You can talk to anybody and this and that because you you share this idea that coming together is really a value, and I think that's true. Yeah. I think uh, it is a, val a value. Not everybody believes that because people are often frightened about meeting the other. You know, because the other. Yeah, but I remember you yeah. and T and TBZ were one of the first to join the Greater uh, Boston, Boston Interfaith, Faith, right? Right, Interfaith, Interfaith Organization, Coalition. right, right, right. We were the first, and that proved to be a very important uh, group for Boston. It's, it's a it, it's a lobbying group. It's a lobbying group for yep. all the things that we need in order to be a safe and prosperous and healthy society, and it, and that's why we can ne never stop pushing because it doesn't always work. <laughs> right, but it's not just Jews. It's many no, Christians, it's, it's, we different have Muslims, denominations, Christians, Muslims, many, many, uh, right? Buddhists. And a lot of uh, a lot of inner city ones, which is good because yes. we connect with them. Those are the burbs. Yeah, connect with the inner yep. city. Uh, it's 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 it, it, it's really a, a refreshing thing. I think you have you have attended these large 
the 70s. Oh, absolutely. And yeah, and when you say it's a lobbying thing, it's like we invite candidates uh, yes, to come we, and we, we hold be their feet concrete. to the fire. Right, we hold their feet to the fire and say, okay. Uh, and we also have tried, and we've been sort of successful in getting a seat at the table. Yes. And, that's and we would important. poll all the members, like, what do you think are the most important topics this coming year? And it, we it's vote. A, it's a totally participatory. It table. It's a participatory. Uh, it's a really, it's, there, it's based upon a uh, theory of, uh, of, of community building that was started by a man called Saul Alinsky. I don't know if you've heard about him, whatever. It was the idea yes. that, that things have to come from the bottom up. They can't come from the top down. If you want to build yeah, community. He was an organizer. He was a mm -hmm. he was the real father of community organizing, you know. And uh right. which I think uh, you know has worked because now there are many cities that have taken on this model. Uh but Boston was one of right. the more successful ones, I must say. Yep. So let's come back to your story, humor, why you became a scholar. I know that you didn't want to be a pulpit rabbi, but you right. got kind of uh, yeah, invited. I, uh, Go ahead. Well, Let's... I got I I uh, uh, had have had many different careers over the years. Uh, I didn't get ordained, quote unquote, until I was forty-seven years old, and I did it the mm -hmm. more traditional way, which was the laying on of hands by three mentors mm. who asked me to carry on their lineage. So I didn't, hmm. so because I already had the graduate school thing. I got the PhD. I wrote the dissertation. I had that. Also, I had right. a very extensive uh, a Jewish background studying in, in many uh, parochial schools from the time I was, you know, three to the time I graduated high, high school. I lived in Israel for years. I'm fluent in Hebrew. I'm fluent in Yiddish. And I'm a sort of a connection to the Eastern European experience, which, uh, which uh, unfortunately, as we know, uh, was destroyed. Uh, but uh, but uh, I, I I think there's a lot of value, and there's been a revival. Those of you know about the klezmer music phenomena, where people are reaching back and bringing music from that time, and because of that, being in, interested in Yiddish again. For those who don't know what Yiddish is, Yiddish is a a, lang a language used by Jews for about a thousand years uh, in Eastern and Central Europe. It is a perhaps you can call it a fusion language. It's written in Hebrew l l letters. It has a lot of German in it, old German. Mm -hmm. And wherever Jews lived, they brought more words in, Slavic words, you know. Uh, certainly, you know, in the, in the United States, the first generation who came and spoke Yiddish, the second started speaking what we call Yinglish, <laughs> you know, like Spanglish. You know the term Spanglish? Right. With, yes. You know, so give our listeners a, a, a little uh, offer, a little morsel. Say something, uh, and then explain what. Well, you the, well, say. the show that I'm doing, uh, you can live if they let you, is a translation of a very old Yiddish adage: "Mikelaben uh, obemelosnisht." You can live, but they don't let let you. I simplified it a little bit to, you know, uh, you can live if they let you. So, you know, look, Mekenzugasach of Yiddish, Mekenzugasach, you can say a whole lot in Yiddish. You don't speak Yiddish, Yiddish speaks itself. Uh, and it's a, <laughs> it's a, uh, it, it's a very heartfelt lang lang language. It's also a language in which, mm -hmm. uh, people have this idea that, you know, uh, that, you know, we were a very closed community. But uh, if you look at the development of Yiddish in the end of the 19th into the, into the 20th century, these were the most universalist Jews. They were socialists, and they believed that Yiddish was the language of reaching the masses. And, mm. and, they, and, and they were successful with it. And they were socialists. Yeah. They, they translated every major book in the world into Yiddish. Uh, so it wasn't a closed, you know, a parochial society. And I think that's one of the mythologies of, of uh, you know, you often hear the insult, the Jews are clannish, clannish, mm. whatever that really means, but clannish. And I say, you know, it's, it's, we, we, we live in the balance. And I think this is important, not only for Jews, but for everybody. We live in a balance between particularism and universalism. Mm. It's a balance. And the only way I believe, and many believe, that you can affect the universal is by being true to your particularism, right? A me yeah. metaphor that has been brought forth 
there is a, a, a ram's horn that we blow on the high holy days, and it's called the shofar. Right, shofar. Shofar, yep. shofar so good. You know that's the difference. Shofar so good. And, and, and <laughs> good. so if you blow through the wide end of it, you'll make no sound. But if you blow through the small end, your particularism, you can make a sound that really rouses, yeah. rouses the world. And I think every individual has to be true to oneself first. And that's, that's one of my critiques, by the way, of some social activism, if I could be critical, mm. is that, uh, Please. is that, you know, they want to liberate other people and many of them have not liberated themselves. Mm. You know, we have a, a very yep. wonderful prophet that many in certain, in the, both the Christian and Muslim tradition accept him as a prophet. You may have heard the name Isaiah. Very long, mm -hmm. very long book of Isaiah. And uh, yeah. on Yom Kippur, the, this holy day of the year where people fast and they beat their chest, he says, I don't need this fast because there are people down the block who don't have what to eat and don't have shoes to wear, right? And they have shackled themselves. And these people, we know who they are. They're the people who work 40 hours a week and cannot support their fa 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 families. They're mm. slaves. They're wage slaves. If you want to wage say. slaves. Wage slaves. That's you You're taught right, me. Right. So, yeah. and, but at the end of that passage from Isaiah, it talks about how you can uh, affect it is by observing the Sabbath. So the social activists only look at the beginning, <laughs> you know, and and the so-called, you know, more traditional look at the end. But the bottom line is you need both. You need a, a day that uh -huh. liberates you and then you can feel mm -hmm. liberation and then you can transfer liberation to uh, other people. But you know how it is. It's easier to do stuff for others than working on yourself. And it's so important. I want you to talk about Zalman. Yes, Dr. one Shola of the great right, one of my, Jewish uh, with right, feelings. Right. My, my, uh, my, one of the major influences in my life uh, was a, uh, a rabbi that I met 50 years ago now. He's gone 10 years. We're now uh, commemorating his 10th mm. anniversary of his death. His name was Reb Zalman Schachter. And he changed his name. He added, he didn't want to get rid of his name because of the fact that there were few left, you know, because he was from Europe and okay. the of the family was killed. So he added a hyphen with the name Shalomi, because Schachter means slaughterer, a shochet, a ritual Ooh. slaughterer. You know that's what it is, Ooh. right? Which is which yeah. is if you eat if you eat kashrut. if you eat meat, uh, you, right. you have to do it in a ritual way. The Muslims do it the same way. We do it, uh, but he wanted to add something peaceful, so he added shalomi, chapter yeah. shalomi. Now he was a remarkable individual. I could spend uh, you know days and days talking about it, but just you should know he was a visionary, and he was raised within a Hasidic Orthodox environment. But very soon he began to realize that we don't possess the only truth. That we are a, we are an ancient wisdom tradition. That's the way I call it. Yeah. As Buddhism is, mm -hmm. as Christianity is, as Hinduism is. And he really opened himself up to be able to absorb what he could say, the best parts of everything. But while remaining mm. a pretty observant Jew. But he said, I, he said right. I don't want to be orthodox, which means having one view. That's what orthodox means, one view, one, like for instance, you go to a, if you have to wear an orthopedic shoe, what does the orthopedic shoe do for you, right? It keeps your foot in a certain way, right? So that's, mm. so, so since you can be heterodox, heterodox means open to many ideas and still be orthoprax, meaning you can practice your mm -hmm. tradition and there's no contradiction to that. Uh, but of course, people right. are orthodox, uh, would never say we're heterodox because they feel that that's, right. that's an assault on their uh, on their belief system. Another thing Rib Zalman taught, taught mm. me and Rabbi Arthur Green, another teacher of mine, he says, you know, we shouldn't call ourselves believers. The Jewish tradition does not demand belief. Christianity demands it because it is through believing you in in the mm -hmm. saving grace of G G Jesus Christ, by believing in that, you are absolved of your sins. Right? That's the that's the mm -hmm. that's the selling point. At best, he say we should say we're seekers, mm. because the minute you say I believe, you create a dichotomy between the believer and the non-believer. 
Also, belief, to say I believe, it's a little bit uh, of hubris, as if you really know. Yeah. We don't, the older I get, I realize we know very little. <laughs> but, uh, and that's... but you want to be on a path. And that's what I think is uh, any, any seeker, like our traditional law system is called the path. Halakha, the mm. path. And we need a path in life. You don't want to be dragged willy-nilly through life. You say, I have a mm-hmm. path. I'm trying to get somewhere. I'm not sure where. But meanwhile, I... I, I, I continue to seek. And what Reb Zalman taught us was not only to seek it with your own tradition, but find what you can find in other traditions. And he was a real mm-hmm. master of dialogue. And the, one of the best dialogues I've experienced was, was the one with the Dalai Lama back in 1990. Uh, and uh, it was wonderful having him there because he and the Dalai Lama sort of really meshed really early on. Uh, he really blew him away because he came into the first session and he had bothered to inquire of Tibetans that he knew in the States to write a greeting and a prayer for him in Tibetan, which is not an easy language. Wow. And he and he, right. he, he did it. I don't know. I can't tell you if the pronunciation was good or not, but he did it. And, you know, so, wow, this guy's special. <laughs> He's not coming. Yeah. He's not and not. You are there. Right. On the He's trip. not coming to to you know to impose anything on me because a good dialogue, by the way, and I urge people to enter into dialogue because a good dialogue is not trying to overpower the other. Right or convince right. the other. The best thing you could do in a dialogue. This this is what happened in the dialogue with the Dalai Lama is you pull out the best stuff you've got and you lay it there on the table. And they pull out the mm-hmm. best things that they got, and they lay it on the table. And uh, Krista, Krista Sten, Sten, Stendhal, who was the, the uh, bishop of Stockholm, and he headed the Harvard Divinity School, said, you have to come away from a good dialogue with religious envy. Wow, hmm. look what they have. Isn't that great? And they say the same thing. Hmm. i give you an example. We, we talked about the Sabbath as being one of the real things that kept the community together in a- exile, right? That everybody, all Jews in the world, mm-hmm. had this one day of the week that they shared, even no matter where they were. Right. And we explained that traditionally you don't work for 25 hours, you close your shops, etc. And he was like taken aback by it, taken aback. Wow, you mean people actually are willing to sacrifice money? <laughs> you know, which, which is not easy for people. Right. Uh, and uh, we, le- we left, right. we left that, that meeting and we said to each other, well, we convinced him. Now, how do we convince the Jews? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he loved the Shabbat. Yeah. yeah, but I'll add, you know, part of the wisdom tradition is if you, uh, you know, c- encounter uh, somebody's cattle that falls into a right, ditch, right. even though it's Shabbat, you're obliged to right, rescue right. the Certainly animal. If a person is ill, then it's, uh, then it's, it's, it's an imperative you must do something, even right. though it might it might break the yeah. rules, etc. But but all I'm saying, look, I'm, I'm not a, a cheerleader for Judaism. I I don't. When person comes to me, we have a lot of people over the years I've worked with have been you know a public Jew for many years who want to convert to Judaism, right? Mm. So the first thing I say to them is, there's no obligation to be a Jew in order to be a good human being. As a matter of fact, yeah. perhaps the goal of every of the of all of our traditions is that we should create good yeah. human beings. It doesn't always happen, but that should be yep. the goal of whatever it is, Hinduism, Buddhism, Christianity, Islam, is that we're creating a good human being. So you don't have to be a Jew. And then I say, then they come back. If they come back, I say, okay, you came back. You may be more serious about it. But remember, they've killed Jews for being Jews. You don't have to be a Jew. And then they come back again, and then I have to explain to them, well, we have a long tradition. And then I say the most important thing to realize, you might embrace Judaism, but you're going to have to maybe live with Jews. And it may not be the same thing. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like you, you, you go to, you go to, uh, yeah. you know, you go to, 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 to uh, one of these Asian countries that's officially Buddhist, but people may not be li- living up to the principles of, uh, of you right. know, uh, non violence. We had a Buddhist, uh, a Buddhist teacher in Myanmar who was uh, uh, terribly uh, 
aggressive uh, anti-Rohingya guy. You know, it was really uh, very, very sad mm. to see that he could ad advocate violence where there's nowhere in Buddhist teaching mm. that really advocates that. But human beings are right. frail. You know, human beings are frail. We are frail creatures. Right. So so that's enough. You know, right. So I'm not so, advocating, you know, uh, uh, you know that, that, that Judaism has all the answers. As a matter of fact, here's another thing, Reb Zalman, which helped me in, in, in building the community. Was, uh a lot of yeah. people were, a lot of Jews over the years were spiritual sea seekers, and they left Judaism to find it elsewhere. And you know, that right. was not uncommon, 1950s, right. that Judaism was all, you know, more social activism, no one talked about God, really, no one was doing Kabbalah, nothing of this spirit, mysticism. Uh, so... It used to be you would come to the rabbis, oh, good, you came, now I'll give you the truth, get rid of all that nonsense. So Reb Zalman said, no, right. if a person says, I've been sitting in an ashram for two years, or I've been in Buddhism for five years, etc." So the first thing you say to them is, isn't that great? What can you teach me? Brilliant. Isn't mm. that br br brilliant? Yeah, being an active no, but listener, but also saying you must have, you respectful. must have, this must have helped you in some way. You wouldn't have stayed with it. Now you want to yeah. get back to your roots. Great, I'll be glad to help you. But I'm not there to erase every, your your human experience. I want you to bring that into right. your whatever tradition you have, and that I think is really an important factor that we 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 we're so caught up in ideology, and how to think, and this and that, and we don't realize that that ideology not. It, can't replace human experience. It can't. Yeah, you know, or love. Love, of course, you can. You you can make it a you know, a precept, if you will, that you should love, like love your neighbors in the uh, in 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 the Bible. But uh, but you don't know what love is until you experience it. <laughs> right. Right. Uh, right. Have a relationship. That's, right. That's why. Yeah. Like with such. God. Right. Do I know that God exists? Do I? Does it really matter that God exists or not? What matters is that I can have an experience with the divine in some way. Go to the Grand Canyon, mm -hmm. and you look at the Grand Canyon, you go, wow! That wow. <laughs> oh, <laughs> wow. It's beyond words, right? It's, it's, yep. sens it's a sensory yep. experience. And that's really what I think uh, TPC, Temple Beth Zion, and us because we wanted people to have an experience rather than necessarily uh, adhering to an ideology. Right. It was a community of wonderful people, still is, and, vibrant, and, and that you were there for people. They, absolutely. You know, they had a death in the family. They were ill. ill. Right. They were raising money. They were doing ecumenical right. work. Right, and right. Progressive, progressive, but more importantly, realizing justice. that uh, uh, what... What if if we do think about God, or there's a concept of imitating God's ways? You may have heard it, but one of the essential things to imitate is compassion. Mm. This is what the Dalai right. Lama says. He says it's compassion, and he says it's so simple and it's terribly not easy. <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah, not easy. Right. So um, one of the many things that I learned through my relationship with you is uh, uh, Hillel, and uh, he was asked to uh, explain Judaism one on foot, one yeah, leg. One foot, Am I right, remembering right. the story? One, well, please, it's a famous story, the story in the Tal Talmud, uh, which is uh, the Orwell Law, Law, L-O-R-E, and Orwell Law, L-A-U, L-A-W. So uh, a guy comes to H H yeah. H Hillel, a great eld elder we have, and uh, we don't know if he's doing this to, just to give him a, a little jibe or not, whether he's trying to, you know, piss him off, press his mm -hmm. buttons. Right? He says, oh, tell me all of the Torah while you're right. standing on one foot. Right. And the guy, you know, he could have, so he went to his colleague, his colleague first, his colleague Shammai, who didn't agree with him. And the guy said to him, mm. get out of here, you're not serious. That was his reaction. Hillel said, no, okay, do not do. It's very different than what it says in the Bible. He said, do not do to others what you don't want others to do to you. And then he ends it with a thing that everybody forgets. Mm -hmm. Go study. 
This this is just this go is just study. this is Learn the first more. step. But go study, and that became a sort of a a, a parable or a, 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 an example, if you will, a, a, a paradigm is the best word I mean. It's a par- paradigm for ultimately the basic human value to live if they let you. <laughs> Which is why that's why my yeah. my uh, play that I wrote and will perform is called that. You can live yes. if they let you. So um, I want to I want to circle back to this perilous time that we're experiencing now in the United States as a result of the October seventh Hamas attack and rape. Yeah, it was a horrible, a ho- ho- kidnapping. Horrible. Uh, of s- horrible eff- by a group aligned with Iran that knew and has been using the Palestinian people uh, as as right, as for many 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 years, right? And I want I, so I'd love to hear your you share your perspective on as an American Jew myself living in 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 the United States and what I'm hearing with anti-Semitic you know, tropes, what sounds like Hamas speak to me. Uh, I'd love to hear what you... Hamas uh, uh, ultimately has won. They were able, in a very short time, to let these these fountains, if you will, or, you know, of of anti-Semitism, which, as many people don't know and don't want to know, created Zionism. If there wouldn't have been anti-Semitism, Jews would not have said, we have to leave Europe and go back to the homeland. They would have been very comfortable sitting in the cafes in Vienna, whatever. But the anti-Semitism in in Europe at the end of the 19th century was so rife. And then there was the Dreyfus trial. The Dreyfus trial opened up this tremendous battle between two forces in France. So uh, I always tell people, you don't understand. It's not like, you know, because Jews are Zionists, that's why there's anti-Semitism. Not the point at all. And, and uh, Hamas has, has right. been victorious. Now, you might say what the Zionists have said classically is that uh, anti-Semitism is endemic to Western culture. Because the early church, in order to differentiate itself from Judaism to become something new, had to somehow find deep fault in Judaism. Uh, mm-hmm. St. Paul, as he's called, we call him St. Mm-hmm. Paul, but we, 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 we call him Saul, <laughs> his name before he became Paul. Saul couldn't, had right. to denigrate Judaism in a, in a very serious way in order to say that, that, that they have this new covenant, right? Or the New Testament, mm-hmm. whatever you want to call it. The old one has been canceled, right? And that changed, by the way, people may not realize that, but in 1965, there was a famous Vatican Council of 1965 under a remarkable Pope, Pope John XXIII, uh, Bishop Roncalli, where the church officially said, no, the covenant of God with the Jews still remains, and we should stop trying to convert them. Because anyone who knows history, the church, yeah. the church believes in a what is called soteriological exclusivism. There's only one way through our door. Mm. That's the only way, and that's why they used to send mm-hmm. missionaries all over the world to bring people into Christianity, and that they were giving them this opportunity for salvation. Right? That was the idea. So, so it's so anti right. has always been there. I mean, it's October 7th just opened up for many uh, a trauma that has been there for a very long time. It's like when you speak to African Americans, and we say that even now, a hundred years or more after quote unquote the emancipation, which wasn't really the emancipation, we say right. you're still carrying with you that, that trauma. It's true. So, I uh, so people do yeah. not respect the fact that we had uh, six million of our people destroyed 85 years ago <laughs> and they're surprised we're still we're still traumatized right. by it you know uh, and then being a child of survivors I have a much more direct right. kind of connection to it of what we have lost etc so it opened up for me a second kind of tra- trauma and I was really you know I was really in bad shape for yeah. a couple of months 
Uh, I'm better now. And uh, as I say, as someone who has family in, is, in Israel, who studied in Israel, who uh, keeps on top of it too much, by the way, I know more about what's going in Israel than my friends who live, live in Israel. Uh, it, it's, uh, it, it's a mm. worrisome time. It's a worrisome time, particularly in these last few yes. days. I don't know if you, people are following it. We're talking, this is being taped at the beginning of o o August. And the people are actually now preparing right. preparing August, for yeah. an onslaught of uh, Hezbollah in the north, which is an Iranian proxy. Then we got these new guys on this map, the Houthis in <laughs> Yemen. Didn't hear about them for a while. And... Even recently, I must say, it's very upsetting that missiles have still been fired from Gaza. So the process of totally mm -hmm. eliminating Hamas yep. is not easy. So people are living in a very precarious right. kind of way. I think it's causing a lot of psychological issues as well. And, uh, and the internal struggles sure. within Israel, Definitely. the internal str struggles are uh, exacerbating these tra traumas. And, uh, you know, any tradition, Jewish, Christian, uh, Islamic, whatever, that allows apocalyptic people who believe in the apocalypse uh, are going to be in deep tr tr trouble because apocalypticism says in order for mm -hmm. things to be good, things have to be very bad, <laughs> Right. The world's got to be right. destroyed, and then it will rise up again, etc. So rather, uh, right? My mentor uh, Robert rather, J. Left. Yeah, yeah. It's a rather, sorry, uh, you know, what can I say? Fatalistic way of seeing life, you know. Whereas uh, we are in the prophetic tradition. At least people who are a bit more meaning. We believe that maybe we can repair this world. Maybe we right. can take our our swords right. and make them into plowshares. Right. That's the the vision. It's not saying yeah. wait for things to be so yes. bad it'll destroy itself. You know, it's sort of a, you know, it's a it's a fatalistic way of living. Yep, and you yes. are the mess. There is no Messiah. You, know, you it, are it, him it, you know, or it. I mean, Messiah has always been troublesome for us as Jews. You know, it, it tripped it up a number of times. But uh, look, uh, yep. as a Jew, uh, I I talk about this in my show as well. Uh, we are an ever dying people. You ever hear that expression? No, I it's, but not it's true. Sure I like it. We're it's always on the brink explained. of disruption, and yet we're still here. And that pisses a lot of people off. Yep. That we're still here. Yep. And that's, I remember your sermons right yeah, after the Hamas yeah, attack. Yeah. You were talking about, we're, we're still, still here. here. Then, you know, it seems to be a, a thought because we're still here. You know, an, an authentic, if you will, approach, if you're a spiritual person, is to uh, say that the emperor has no clothes. And mm -hmm. it's speak power, truth and to that power. It upsets people with authoritarian <laughs> tendencies, it really upsets them. Yeah, they're the fly in the yep. ointment. If we only got rid of the Jews, I could control the world. <laughs> yep. And, and if I may opine sure. for a minute, Moshe, um, I did an interview with Christopher Leonard, who wrote a book called Coke Land about the right. Coke corporate mm -hmm. cult. And they're the ones funding the free speech movement and FIRE that says that people have the right to say whatever they want to say, to which I say, nonsense. The law has always said you can't scream fire in a crowded theater if there isn't a fire because you're going to hurt people. Lies right. can hurt people. And the law is very clear about this. So this notion that we should empower anyone to say, that, you know, have no censorship and say whatever you want is just them wanting to dismantle democracy and take away the administrative state because they don't want regulations and they want to push yeah. fossil fuels, which right, is how right. they made I mean, their yeah, fortune. Yeah, right. And I think that there are a lot of young liberal Jews that have gotten swept up in an indoctrination into a notion that, that, that Jews are at fault. And, and I, I just... 
you know, definitely there are bad Jews and there are good Jews, but the whole thing is to be to wipe Jews out, which is what right. Hamas right. is committed, committed to, to and Iran has said. Right. They want to wipe they out. They don't hide behind any things. They said, so, and you got to believe people who say they want to kick and kill you. <laughs> you know, what do you say? Oh, you're only kidding. <laughs> you got to believe it. And uh, they'll yeah. do what they, they can. They will not succeed. I'm afraid, though, until that time, we'll have damage right. like we've so, seen in the last 10 months. There'll be a lot of damage by people who don't deserve mm. that kind of damage. But that's always the case. People on top who want control don't really care about the price paid by the people. Yeah. And, and, they don't and, care. And as you've heard me say endlessly with the influence continuum, beware authoritarians who, who, who talk in black and white, us versus them, good versus evil, simplistic, trust us, the superior right. authority figures, right. to tell you right. what reality is instead of our God-given conscience Absolutely. and critical Absolutely. thinking. I, have to, I have to continue to have some hope that there are sane people around. <laughs> I hope so. The only thing that the only thing that can prevent too. Uh, the tragedy of authoritarianism is when sane people are willing to stand up. It didn't ha happen in G G Germany. They did not stand up. It didn't happen el elsewhere. I have some sense in this country there are still some right. sane people who realize if you persecute one group, it never stops with that group. Right. And, uh, and, and, and so for people for, you know, say to me, how could you write the cult of Trump? And aren't you afraid? And I'm like, I couldn't not write the cult of Trump as a cult expert. I never would have right. slept at night because I know what I know. I grew up in Queens. I know Donald Trump. I knew he was <laughs> a the very beginning, narcissist right, 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 right. and a dangerous person forever, from right. the forever. And 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 so and that was before I learned he was yeah. a Russian agent who was an asset r recruited by the Soviet Union, but you know, and people are like, "Aren't you afraid?" And I'm like, "Yeah, but this is a, no time to 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 be quiet. This is a right. time to get active right. and ask everyone else right. who has a spine who wants to know what to do. It's time to get active the next Absolutely. few months before yeah, the election." Uh, we need to right, be registering right, right, more right, people right. who haven't voted, who are qualified, and making Absolutely. sure they get I to mean, the polls we, we, uh, and be right. we focused in on our values. You know, do that well. And I'm glad to see that now there are groups forming everywhere to send postcards. To Actually, we'll have a lot of people traveling in the next few months to all the swing yes. states and do what you have to do, like knock on doors. And the vast majority of people uh, yeah, and might respond to that and say, oh, well, you really came? Well, and we have devout Christians speaking up <laughs> in defense of what right. Jesus actually taught, which was not politics and destroy everyone else right. this is and a great enslave sadness. women and, a great and sadness beat that, children. That, that the, the yeah. Christian majority of the, this country uh, can fall for these kinds of stuff because ultimately uh, we're not the first ones here either. We're the migrants who came here, many of us illegally, <laughs> and destroyed all the native people. Right? People just don't get that. They don't get it. And uh, right. is it because people are stupid and unconscious? Yep. Perhaps. <laughs> I don't want to be... Uh... Well, it's about... Lower yes, yes, levels yes. of consciousness yeah, yeah. Right, and right. having to, right. you know, come to the realization that that what I learned from you in 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 my return to to our faith is that we are one. We are one. If if we you take one. these, the idea that uh, that all of us are ninety nine point nine percent the same. Everybody poops, and everybody uh, has to eat, and everybody has to sleep. Right? Everybody. There's nobody outside of that. There's no one figure. And the DNA, 99.9%. Proves it. So what is that extra right. little bit that's diff 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 different? I like to tell you that that 0.6 or whatever it is, is, is your soul. It's what makes you, you. 
Mm-hmm. And it's, it seems like a little bit, but you know what? It's enough to make you you. And I think we have to we have to understand that. Yeah. We are not saying everybody's the same. We're saying everybody deserves to be who they are, and that's the same. No matter what culture you're in, no matter yeah. what culture you're yep. in, whatever. And it's hard for people because we like to demonize, as you said, we like to demonize the other. Demonize. They're less than human. The language that's mm-hmm. being used is the same language that we saw. Yep. Unfortunately, you know, 85, 90 years ago, right? So it's, you know, it's... Uh... Well, we, we, you know, psychology has developed a lot since Edward Bernays. We now have a lot more knowledge of social psychology. Now we have digital media, internet. Now we have AI. And I think it's critical that people come That's back true. to human values of real relationships, Absolutely. not digital relationships, Absolutely. real community where children are not raised on iPads, but they're raised looking into the faces and, and it's of not their, easy. It's their not parents, easy. their it's, siblings, their relatives. iPads have become relatives. what TV was to our parents. But, Remember that? Sit them, down, sit them down in front of the cartoons. Yeah, but, but, <laughs> It'll be all right. I'm afraid that I was of the TV generation. I should say my family had a radio. I remember yeah, when we deal. got a black and that white TV. Deal. Then we got a color TV. And I was addicted. Sure. I would come All home from many school of us and I'd many be of us you know, watching the afternoon I was speaking to a you know, young 17-year-old. Yeah, please. But I had my first yes. years. I had no. I had my first years that, interacting right. with humans, too. not too. with no. Pixels. But social media, you know, is uh, it's 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 uh, again, as I said early on, it it creates this idea of being a follower. I'm a follower, which is such a. It's obviously negative term mm-hmm. if you think about it. We shouldn't be following. Yeah. We should basically be creating ourselves and not following and living my life through Taylor Swift. I mean, who is wonderful. I very talented. She's talented. She's beautiful. <laughs> obviously has a good business acumen as well, right? She's done very well for herself. But I people live their right. lives through celebrities. And what do we use the term today? We use idols. There's a show called American Idol. Hmm. So yeah. we are idolaters. <laughs> yeah. We are all idolaters. Yeah, and we're not supposed to be. Right. I think we're coming to the end of our be. time, but I just want to say one thing about idolatry. Idolatry. Yeah. All of, all, you know, tradition says that, you know, idolatry, the way I've come to be taught with my TT to teachers, is when one begins to worship the fragment and not see the whole, W-H-O-L-E. And this mm. was the contribution uh, in, of, in, to mm-hmm. monotheism by Ab- Abraham, who everybody respects in all the three re- Abrahamic religions, right? What was his thing? Right. I love trees. They're great. I love trees. I'm a tree worshiper. But you know what? There's something bigger than trees. Oh, the stars. Oh, I love the stars. But there's something mm. that we can't fathom that is larger. And that became, uh, if you will, one of the great contributions to civilization. Um, you know, it's 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 has its it, it's 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 been uh, sullied in many many ways over the years, because some monotheistic say, well, uh, it's a turf mm. game. Christianity took over Judaism. Islam came mm-hmm. and said, ah, oh, Judaism and Christianity were falsified, and we came to bring you the truth. So that's we have to be careful about. It knowing or saying, I'm bringing you the truth with a right. capital T. You know, I'm not sure there is a truth with a capital right. T. Right. Right. So before we wrap up, yeah, you once shared a word with me that I thought, and then I had to look it up, panentheism. Panentheism, right. Panentheism. Yes. Could you yeah. share with my listeners? Yes. Uh, for those who may not know, the word theism means God. Mm-hmm. Uh, pantheism, pantheism, which many people I think know. I don't know. You can't assume anybody knows anything. For the pan means all over, right? You know, panorama, mm-hmm. right? A view from all over. So if you're a pantheist, you see that everything is God, mm-hmm. like like Spinoza, right? Everything was God. Mm-hmm. So for me, that's very powerful. And I must say, uh, as we say in Yiddish, when I stickle, 
a little bit of a pantheist. However, those who mm -hmm. would like to still have something beyond the realm, beyond, uh, would be theists, right? I'm a theist. Mm -hmm. However, there's a way of maybe finding a way to have both together, and that would be uh, to pan entheism. E N was put in there, and it's being used by many d different traditions as well. And I think that uh, when we celebrate anything, uh, certainly Judaism is based on nature and based on agriculture and all that. When we're celebrating right. that, we're celebrating the processes of nature. Mm -hmm. It is remarkable what the natural world is. It inspires awe. Yes. Physics is un effing believable. <laughs> it's yes. really un <laughs> right? It's, 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 yeah. And there's a lot to admire. Yeah. And the fact that physics is not whimsical. Physics right. says the sun will come up tomorrow again. Even when you see clouds, the sun is still coming up. That's pretty, right. that, that's pretty, what can I say? For me, very awe inspiring. So that's why I'm not an Orthodox rabbi, pretty much, because I can't, I can't just say, you know, uh, you know, it, it, God created. Yes, that's the thing. If you have a sense of God that created physics, the universe, right. I don't need God to come and interfere in it. Mm -hmm. That's enough. That's enough to inspire right. me, right? So I hope right. people who are listening to this realize that they that we still are very unsophisticated when it comes to religion. And we like yep. to put people into little boxes, and we want them to stay in the box, and have, don't don't have a sense of the larger picture. And that's what you do all the time in your work. How do you get people out of the box? Right, exactly. That's it. One more concept before I let please, you go. That, please, that I. So you taught me that we don't take scripture literally. We have a rabbinic. Right. tradition right. to interpret. Right. Can you share a right. little bit more about right. Right. what right. Judaism in the 21st century is about? Well, from the even two millennia ago, one of the most, the, the greatest impetus was to use the human imagination. Believe it or not, mm -hmm. it's a very powerful tool, the human imagination, to interpret right. the, 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 the scripture, right? So mm -hmm. uh, as uh, as I was trained within the Orthodox community, you're not permitted to to have the scripture without commentary. Mm -hmm. An example, uh, everybody quotes this, oh, the Bible says an eye for an eye. But the rabbis knew you'd have two people without eyes. If you, <laughs> that wouldn't, that's, not, right. that's not very helpful. So they develop a whole right. thing about damages. The damages, the, the recompense, the compensation for damages should be equal to the uh -huh. damage done. And there's a, a whole tractate, a whole thing in the Talmud. The Talmud is the commentary uh, that is basically going to become one of the bases for uh, for uh, uh, injury law in the, in all of Western Europe. You pay for right. medical bills. You pay for even you pay for the embarrassment. Mm -hmm. That a person might have by not ha having an eye, whatever it is. So without mm -hmm. that, we would we would uh, we would not understand what's going on, and we're not allowed to take it literally. We're just not allowed to, and uh, right. and I think that's really so different. But you got to understand, those who say they take the Bible literally still pick and choose what they take. It's very clear. It's very clear that you don't eat shellfish. Right there, right. Leviticus chapter eighteen. Right there, and the same word is being gay, right? Isn't that it? abomination? Right, abomination. Or using that word abomination, but somehow it hasn't stopped people in Louisiana from eating crawfish. I mean, so so, so, right. so, so everybody picks and chooses, and they claim that they are mm -hmm. literalists about the Bible, which is not right. true. So. Uh, when we study Torah, we study the five books, we say uh, everyone in our tradition is obligated to comment on it. Not only know what other people said, but what does it mean to you? And right. how do you bring your human experience into this? 
because ultimately, even though people say it's the word of God, it's still, we say it was written by the hands of Mo Moses, who was a human being. Right. <laughs> you know, right. uh, so I think that's a real challenge for people of how do you create a, I gave a talk two years ago about interpretation. The people ask me, what is it that's important? You need imagination and you need interpretation and you need the capacity to use your intellect. All of those things are important. But you must right. realize that 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 you know things coming out of a book are not necessarily going to work unless it yeah. jives somehow with your human experience. And we should give right. more and more credit to human beings. It's hard sometimes, <laughs> you know. Right. But uh, we should give more credit that people can bring their experience into understanding the world, understanding themselves. And hopefully understanding the other, because guess yeah. what, the other also has the capacity for imagination, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, this is yeah. our challenge, Steve. Beautiful. This is our challenge, and uh, it's our... and I think the people you invite, I must say, to your uh, pod podcast, all feel that this is the challenge, and that uh, we're up to it if we're willing to yeah. take it on, if we're willing to take yeah. it on, and that's why. It's sad when you see so many millions and millions who don't want to take that on. It's just, it's, it's upsetting. Yeah. 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 So uh, but again, thank you for inviting me and giving me a chance to pontificate a little bit here. Uh, it's it's my pleasure yeah. and honor. Thank you again my, my for pleasure. touching me so deeply in my soul because I'm so grateful. People are, you know, continually see the spelling of my last name and think I'm not a Jew, but I am a Jew and I identify as a Jew and I always will identify as a Jew. And I want to encourage you to think about a platform where you're getting your message out to more and more people because I think people would really benefit also from your scholarship and your sense of humor and your groundedness well, you're just a, an well, amazing now, person well now now that i'm so a, thank now you. that i'm officially retired from this particular job yeah who knows it's possible by the way hasan yeah. hasan means that you had a, in your ba ba background someone who was a cantor a hasan exactly and my great grandfather was a cantor, in latvia was a was a cancer, right. was a singer and, of the Holy Songs. And he was songs. called Hazan, and it became written in English exactly. as Hassan. But it's the same. Ellis Island eyes. Same, yeah, yep, exactly. It's exactly the same name, uh, et cetera. A very classic name, by the yep. way. You know, it's, it's like it? here in the okay, United great. States, we name people after their occupations, right? So as we wrap up, I wait let's to everybody. do a short, short divar on Shalom. Well, Shalom, the word Shalom means uh, wholeness wholeness from the root shalem. Uh, and uh, it talks about not only uh, peace, but it talks about the capacity uh, to maintain your equilibrium. Equilibrium. Mm. And the possibility, and it's not, not easy, it's simple, but not easy, uh, to achieve some sense of tranquility. Mm. We are not able very often to feel tranquil as the mm. world invades us every moment with information, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, when I wish you shalom or you wish somebody shalom, you're basically saying, be a whole person. Mm, I love be it. Be a whole person. Shalom. shalom. Be Red Moshe Waldock. Be a whole person. See you soon. Take care now. Take bye care. Bye-bye. Okay, bye. Steve Hassan here. You know, it's been decades since my family rescued me from the Moonies. I've been at this for over 47 years. The need has never been greater. If you're able, please consider hitting the super thanks button below and it'll help us to do better. Every penny will help us toward our goal of educating the planet about undue influence. Remember, it's your mind, only you should control it.